Okay, let's start with some pre-test questions. Uh, which of the following is not? So uh, those of you who were not here yesterday, I'm very big on vital signs, but not just the vital signs you're familiar with. Uh, there are uh, there are lacrimal vital signs. What I mean by that is the most important parts of a lacrimal or tearing exam. Um, so what is not an important part of the uh, lacrimal exam? So true or false, are, are, is watery eye the same as epiphora? Okay. The most common cause of congenital epiphora is nasolacrimal duct obstruction, entropion, um, uh, blocked valve of Hassner, and functal stenosis. Which eyelid disorder does not commonly cause epiphora? Does everybody know what this means? Dermatocolasis. Okay, ectropian, entropian, caruncal hypertrophy, caruncal, and conjunctival calasis. Okay, so this is the objectives. Okay, so anatomy, okay? So you all know uh, the lacrimal gland is the main way in which the tears are produced. Uh, they exit the lacrimal gland uh, through these tiny ducts uh, in, in, um, on the um, conjunctival side inside the eyelid, and the tears float around the eyes, right? And they drain through the lacrimal system. You get the punctum, upper and lower punctum. You get the uh, very thin tubes, the canaliculi, that uh, enter into the common internal punctum, a lacrimal sac, uh, which is located at the med at the medial canthus right there, okay, um, and then and then you get uh, um, the nasolacrimal duct that goes into the nose and uh, exits at the inferior turbinate. So memorize this because it is very important to know this. So when it comes to a lacrimal system, uh, there's three things you should always think of. Patients come to my office crying all the time with tears falling down. When it comes to tears, there's production. Uh, distribution and drainage, okay? And all three things can cause tearing, okay? Or not, a disruption of all three things can cause tearing. So for example, uh, production, okay? So, you know, uh, if you have dry eye, you get irritation, you get reflexive tearing, and that's, and that's one way. So always look at the ocular surface, look at the cornea, conjunctiva, to make sure there's nothing going on. So by distribution, I'm just going through all these three, okay? So by distribution, it's really the tear film. And you know the tear film has three parts, right? Uh, the most important one is the aqueous. Then there's a mucin produced by conjunctival uh, cells. And then there is the uh, uh, lipid layer that's produced by the eyelid glands, right? So if there is abnormality in any of these, you get immune diseases like rheumatoid arthritis, lupus, Sjogren's, sarcoid, all these things can cause uh, trouble with this layer. You, get, you can get dry eye, then you get tearing. Blepharitis can cause uh, um, trouble with this. And of course, any kind of conjunctival disease, pterygium, trachoma, you know, uh, infection can cause uh, trouble with the mucin layer and can cause uh, tear film trouble and then more tearing. So usually when we think of lacrimal, we always think of this, but you know, really you should never uh, forget that production and distribution can also cause tearing. So the, obviously the thing that we think about is blocking of drainage of the, of, of, of the, uh, of, of the toilet, you know? And uh, basically uh, that, uh, you know, that can happen because of two things. The most common thing is obviously obstruction of the nasolacrimal duct but also uh, the lacrimal pump. Anybody know what the lacrimal pump is? You guys know what the lacrimal pump is, right? Yeah. So, you know, the way the tears go into our system is by really blinking. As we blink, uh, the orbicularis contracts and it squeezes the uh, lacrimal pump uh, and it also creates pressure where the tears are sucked in. And so if anything is wrong with the eyelid blink or the orbicularis, that will cause tearing. Okay, so just to, uh, you know,
for distribution and drainage, uh, you need normal eyelid, like I said. If eyelid is not normal, then you may have tearing problems like ectropion, entropion, uh, trachoma, you know, whatever, uh, uh, facial nerve palsy, um, you know, things like that. So these are examples of things with the eyelids that can cause tearing. So sometimes fixing the eyelid, you can fix the tearing. So, you know, this is an entropion, okay? And obviously these eyelashes are rubbing against the cornea. The, uh, uh, the eyelid muscles like the retractors are loose. And so this patient will have tearing. Uh, this is a patient with seven nerve palsy. Uh, they have lagophthalmus, they have uh, a paralysis ectropion. Um, and uh, so their lacrimal pump, they can't blink, so they can't push the tears into the system, so they will have tearing. Uh, this is a patient with um, ectropion, okay? So obviously, she will have tearing. Um, and another example of uh, same patient with lagophthalmus, okay? So, um, Two causes of a tearing eye could be reflex tearing, so that's that's distribution and poor lacrimal thumb function. Okay, I will skip this. I I mentioned this before, so you know punctum uh, can look like common internal punctum. Uh, where is it? Okay, so punctum can look like common internal punctum, lacrimal sac, nasolacrimal duct, inferior meatus, uh, and valve of Hasner. Uh, right in the inferior meatus, uh, in the inferior turbinate, there's a valve. Usually when we're born, the valve is closed. As we grow, the valve opens up. Sometimes in kids, that valve does not open up and we have congenital tearing. So if you know all these parts, then you can figure out where is the blockage. Yeah, so basically um, the, the, what's called the fundus or the top of the lacrimal sac comes just above the medial canthus, okay? The nice thing is that the, uh, and it doesn't show here unfortunately, but the lacrimal sac is surrounded by the uh, anterior part of the medial canthal tendon and the posterior part. They basically sandwich the lacrimal sac. Um, and as long as you know your anatomy, you know that the lacrimal sac is slightly deeper, right? Um, and so when making your incision, you just have to be careful. You know that in, in this area, the top of the lacrimal sac comes in. So you have to be careful in, in, your, in your dissection. Um, the, other thing is, um, the other thing is that the, the, the lacrimal sac is contained, um, is it here? It's contained in the, um, in the lacrimal sac fossa. No, I, I see a point. So what I, what I normally do uh, when I'm working is that I put a probe in this to protect it. So then I know exactly where it is. I put a probe in and then do my surgery around the probe. So um, if I see the metal, I know I'm going too deep and I stop. What is the difference between watery eye and the tearing eye? So I, for my uh, diagnostic purpose, I make them different. Why? Because it helps me treat the patient, okay? So I have made it different. I treat the watery eye and the tearing eye or epiphora different, okay? I call the tearing eye true epiphora, okay? So when a patient comes in and they say, my eye is watery, my eye is wet, okay? I define that as a watery eye. When they say, doctor, my tears are coming out of my eyes and falling onto my cheeks, that's what I call uh, usually epiphora. That's a good clinical way of diagnosing the two, okay? So the first thing I always ask is, do your tears come down your cheek or do they stay in the eye? That's the first question I ask any patient who comes in with tearing. If it's watery eyes, usually it's a, it's a problem with the eyelid or the eye surface. If it's a true epiphora, that gives you a hint that there may be some nasal, uh, some lacrimal system obstruction going on. So epiphora really means obstruction, by definition, means obstruction of the lacrimal system, um, and which means um, an operation will be required to correct this. So often I call myself a plumber because we're really working with pipes and, and opening up blockages. And again, just to summarize this, um, you know, 
uh, tears overflowing on, so epiphora is tears coming on cheek, suggests uh, an lacrimal duct obstruction, surgical condition. Watery eyes is no tears on cheek, uh, very non-specific. Patient comes in, oh, doctor, I'm tearing. Um, they have a very poor tear quality and they have blepharitis, so you would treat this medically. Again, just to emphasize, uh, you know, clues to lacrimal system obstruction uh, that I use are epiphora. Uh, if, it's, if it's unilateral, uh, then most likely it's a lacrimal system obstruction. So, you know, obstruction in the punctum, the canaliculus, the lacrimal sac, the uh, duct, okay? If they have dacrocystitis, infection of the lacrimal sac, and um, yeah, okay. So, I mean, in, in, in your case, trachoma and conjunctivitis are probably uh, are common causes of lacrimal system obstruction, right? Because it blocks up the, uh, the punctum or the canaliculus. But facial fracture nasal surgery. We'll skip this. I mean, this is a, uh, so basically in kids, uh, any kind of tearing eye plus mattering, what I mean by mattering is hair, you know, all this, all this sort of pussy, crusty discharge, okay? I basically uh, consider that to be congenital NL uh, nasolacrimal duct obstruction. Usually occurs within one to two months of life, um, you know, and so you diagnose it early. And there's a blocking of the valve of Hasner, which I showed you in the inferior turbinate. 90% resolve in the first year of life. Uh, a classic, classic example of a child with nasolacrimal duct obstruction. I will go through treatment of that later. Okay, uh, we already discussed this again. Um, but if you, so this is, uh, when, when, looking at, when looking at the lacrimal system, um, I separate it into, into the upper system and the lower system. The upper system is the punctum and the canaliculus. The lower system is the lacrimal sac and nasolacrimal duct obstruction. So in the upper system, um, usually if they have obstruction in the, uh, in the punctum or the canaliculus, it usually causes only tearing. Obstruction here causes tearing plus mucus discharge. Um, just to quickly talk about physical exam. So the, the physical examination starts when a patient like this walks into your office crying. I have already said this, but I'll emphasize it. You know, obviously look at the uh, ocular surface for any tearing patient. Uh, as eye care providers, you have to look at everything. So you look at the cornea, conjunctiva, look at the eyelid, eyelash, and the lacrimal system. Yeah, so we always spoke about ectropian, uh, entropian, you know, trichiasis, which is, uh, how, how common is trachoma here? Very common, right, yeah. So trachoma is a big cause of tearing and entropian and eyelid problems, obviously, and ocular surface problems, yeah. Uh, look for lacrimal pump problems, anything that, that prevents the eyelid from blinking and pushing those tears down the, down the system. So eyelid deformity, scar tissue, facial nerve palsy, um, and, and uh, age-related stuff, so ectropian. So um, there is uh, two eyelid tests that I do when examining a patient to determine whether uh, tightening their eyelid uh, will make a difference or whether uh, you know eyelid uh, looseness is causing their tearing. So one is called a snapback test, uh, where you basically uh, push their eyelid down and ask them not to blink, and if the eyelid comes up very slowly, then that's a loose eyelid. Because you can see, if, if to me, if I go like this, it comes up right away, right? So that's called the eyelid uh, snapback test. The eyelid uh, distraction test is if you push the eyelid out and it stretches all the way down. Anything more than a centimeter is a very loose eyelid. So doing an ectropin repair will help their tearing and help their ocular surface. And that's called the eyelid distraction test. And, uh, you know, I always tell, I always tell my patients that, why we all get everybody, any race, all, all countries, all cultures, why we get ectropian is that because usually when we cry or when we rub our eyes, we always rub down, right? And if you, if you rub down for 20, 30 years, you'll get an ectropian at the end of it. So always rub up. So whenever you rub and rub your teeth, always rub up and you won't get an ectropian. 
when you have tears. Then you won't come to me in 20 years. Okay, good. So um, uh, looking at uh, punctal problems, okay, uh, when a patient comes in tearing, look at the eyelid, okay? Uh, you look at a punctal ectropion. So sometimes if you look at the punctum, the punctum could be out, that can cause tearing. Uh, you look at punctal stenosis, patients with uh, trachoma, glaucoma, who are on glaucoma medications, those medications can cause punctal uh, stenosis. So look for that. Uh, sometimes uh, in congenital cases, children are born with a membrane on the punctum or no punctum, look for that. So that's an example of a punctal ectropin. You can see the punctum is out. It's not draining any tears. Sometimes some patients will have conjunctival calasis and caruncle hypertrophy. Do you guys know what they are? This is an example of caruncle hypertrophy, okay? See how the caruncle is really large? It's blocking the tears from getting into the punctum. And you can often, and, and you know, this is actually a pretty important cause of tearing that a lot of uh, uh, people uh, don't think of or, or miss. And, and so always look at the, at, at the corner and, uh, and, see, and see what the corner of the, or the medial canthus to be, uh, you know, looks like. And uh, it may have some, um, something blocking. So what I do is I will actually trim or cut this caruncle off to make more room in the corner here for the tears to go in. And what else does he have? This is conjunctival calasis. It's extra conjunctival tissue, okay? And you can see here, um, you can also trim this tissue and basically, uh, you know, uh, uh, decrease the obstruction here. Um, obviously, eyelash changes, uh, entropion, trichiasis, chronic blepharitis can all cause uh, tearing. This is uh, trachoma. You can see, if you check the fornix, you can see a lot of symblepharon and scarring. Um, and of course, uh, you know, uh, you, you rule out dacrocystitis. So, um, we talked about the eyelid vital signs. Now we talk about the lacrimal system vital signs. Uh, and there's three that you check for in, in any patient that comes in with tearing. One is the dye disappearance test, or DDT. Uh, palpation of the canaliculus, okay, and the lacrimal irrigation. The DDT or the dye disappearance test is a very useful thing to do if you don't want the hassle or you don't have a cannula to inject the lacrimal system. It's a really useful and actually pretty accurate way of, uh, of uh, diagnosing a nasolacrimal duct obstruction. Uh, what you do is you take any kind of fluorescein. It doesn't have to be 2%. Fluorescein, 2% is nice, but if you can get even a fluorescein strip, you put in the corner um, uh, and uh, in the conjunctival fornix, and you wait about five minutes and check to see how much dye is left in the eye. A normal result is something like this. An abnormal result is something like this, where the dye stays in the eye. Because sometimes you may not have time or you may not have the cannula to inject, right? So or in a child. I mean, in a child, you can't inject them, right? Uh, they won't let you. So you have to use this, uh, the dye dis disappearance test. Yes. yes. So this side has a, this side has a nasal, so this is after five minutes. This side has a nasolacrimal duct obstruction, um, and this side is normal. Same with the adults. This side is normal because all the fluorescein has gone in, and this side is, uh, has a nasolacrimal duct obstruction. And it actually is a pretty accurate test. They've done studies where they've irrigated these patients after and they've had blockage. So it's a very accurate test. Okay, um, this is catalicular palpation. Um, basically checking how open it is. You can either, either, uh, either touch right here and if something comes out, well, then they're blocked. It's like pus comes out, right? Um, if you're courageous and you have a lot of courage and you want to do this, you can also probe them to see if there's a, st a stricture, an obstruction in the canalicular system. And of course, the most common way of diagnosing nasolacrimal duct obstruction is lacrimal irrigation, right? And this will tell you exactly where the blockage is, whether you have partial obstruction or it's closed. 
Um, I use a 27 gauge uh, cannula. The nice thing with a 27 gauge cannula is that you do not need a punctal dilator because a 27 gauge cannula will fit into all size of punctum, right? Um, I use a three uh, milliliter or CC syringe. We have pretty good water systems there. So I just use tap water. I don't know what the water system is here is in Cameroon. You may want to use saline in Cameroon. So I use uh, water. Uh, I stretch the eyelid and uh, I irrigate in the canaliculus to see what's going on. So this is an example. So notice my fingers here. I'm stretching the eyelid because if you don't stretch the eyelid, then you can make a false passage. You can, uh, you can go right through the canaliculus and make a false passage. So make sure you stretch the eyelid so that you stretch the canaliculus. So you see I'm stretching. And with my other finger, I'm holding um, the upper punctum out so I can see if there's a blockage, right? You can get an assistant to help you. I just do it myself. Any reflex or any stuff coming out is abnormal. So um, this is just an example of, of a full LACMAL exam. We've already talked about this. And this is uh, the Toronto, Canada skyline. Um, I will end off with, with uh, and I'll, I'll do the treatment part now. I will end off with one thing, um, is that when it comes to tearing, you treat the patient, not the disease. So if the patient is not bothered by their tearing and they're okay with it and there's no infections going on, then you don't have to do anything, right? Uh, only if they're really bothered by the tearing and, it's, and they're getting infections and whatever, then you do something. So now you know the answer to this, don't you? Yeah, okay. So it's the eyelid distraction test. And you guys know, and you guys know that this is uh, false. Um, the most common cause of congenital epiphora is non-patent valve of Hasner.